Okay, so in the next half hour, I would like to discuss regulation of transcription on the elongation level. And um, we heard about the initiation yesterday. And now what you need to remember is that in metazoan cells, at many genes, the polymerase gets started but immediately gets paused again. And this happens already after it has transcribed 50 base pairs of DNA, produced 50 nucleotides of RNA. Then you get into this pause state and that can be stabilized by protein factors. And now what needs to happen is that you need to convert this paused polymerase into an active elongation complex by phosphorylation and by the exchange of elongation factors. So you need to exchange negative against positive factors. And then this activated elongation complex is capable of moving very fast through the gene, including uh, nucleosomes. Uh, so it runs through chromatin, as I told you, at a speed of about 3,000, 4,000 nucleotides a minute, traversing about 10 or 15 nucleosomes each minute. Right? Now here, so in a little more detail, uh, are these transitions from initiation to the pause state. So the pre-initiation complex is converted in a, into a pause elongation complex. And then by phosphorylation with a factor called positive transcription elongation factor B, which contains a kinase, the so-called CDK9 kinase, by phosphorylation you convert the PEC into the complex EC star, uh, the activated elongation complex. And this now carries, this polymerase carries not only DSIF, which is a you know, general elongation factor, but also SPT6 and the so-called PATH complex, which are positive transcription elongation factors and also help the polymerase to go through chromatin. This red factor here is the negative elongation factor. It has four subunits, and that is known to stabilize the pause state of the polymerase. So the polymerase can adopt that pause state, but then the negative elongation factor is stabilizing the pause state. So what we've done is we resolved the polymerase in the pause state, uh, the so-called PEC complex that you see here. Um, Polymerase is in silver. You see the downstream DNA coming in from the right, upstream DNA entering to the top, uh, exiting to the top here. And then you see DSIF in green. It's a two subunit elongation factor. It actually binds around the cleft of polymerase, but also around the RNA exit tunnel, which is here towards the back. And then this colorful factor here is the negative elongation factor NELF which binds on the opposite side. Here's the structure of the pause elongation complex, also solved by cryo-electron microscopy. And there's various mechanisms that the negative elongation factor uses to uh, make this pausing more stable. And it's mainly through conformational stabilization of the state. Uh, and if you look into the active site of the pause state, you see something that is different from the active elongation complexes that I've talked to you so far. And that is what we call a tilted hybrid. Remember the DNA-RNA hybrid uh, is formed in the active site and it, uh, there's eight to nine base pairs being formed. And uh, in active elongation complexes, this hybrid is aligned properly to allow for the nucleotide addition cycle to occur, right? And in the pause state, what we see is that the DNA-RNA hybrid is actually tilted like this. Now you may say, wow, is, why is that so problematic? It's problematic because there's no template base available to bind the incoming nucleoside triphosphate. So you see in gray here, this is the template base in an active state and it's free, right? It's free, it can accept a nucleoside triphosphate and form Watson Crick base pairs, right? But when this template base is engaged in a base pair with 
the last base of the RNA transcript in the tilted state, it's not available to bind the next substrate. And this is why the tilted state is associated with pausing of the polymerase. Right? So it's an offline state. The other states that you've seen in the movie are online states, the states of the nucleotide addition cycle. But the frayed state, uh, the backtracked arrested state, and also the tilted state, these are offline states because they are offline from the nucleotide addition cycle that normally uh, ensures RNA synthesis. And this is why polymerase pauses, right? Now, TF2S is known to cleave the backtracked RNA, as I've shown you before, but it actually also is inducing a change in the bridge helix, and it's known to convert the tilted state back to the normal state of the hybrid. So TF2S can reactivate also those paused complexes. So what NELF is doing, it has to keep TF2S off, otherwise TF2S will reactivate the paused state, right? And this is actually now the pore where the RNA exits during backtracking. And you see NELF is actually binding just across this pore in the funnel region of the polymerase. So TF2S cannot enter the pore, it cannot reactivate uh, the pore state, and this is also a mechanism that the negative elongation factor uses to keep TF2S off and to preserve the pore state. So multiple mechanisms. Now we want to convert the pore elongation complex into the active state, what we call EC star, right? Because when we have both structures and we compare them, we can learn you know, what's different and how you actually activate a post polymerase and how you convert it into the active elongation complex. So let's move to the next structure. Here's the activated state. Again, you see the polymerase in silver and you see this green factor DSIF, which stays bound. It's moving a little bit, but it's you know, a general elongation factor that is generally bound. But now another factor is joined, which is called SPT6 that you see here in blue. And there's also this factor here, which is five subunits. It's called the PATH complex. And those are both um, positive transcription elongation factors. Now, when you look at the structure, one thing that, you know, is very interesting here is that the PATH complex actually binds to an overlapping site on the funnel of the polymerase. So it's the simplest possible switch, you know, two factors exclude each other from binding to the polymerase surface. Uh, you can either bind NELF or you bind the PATH complex. When you look into the active site, now everything is normal again. In this active elongation complex, you have a free DNA base in the template that can accept a nucleoside triphosphate. But when you compare the pause state and the uh, activated state, you not only see that difference in the active site, you also see that the negative elongation factor and the PATH complex bind to overlapping sites on the polymerase. So you can either be in the pause state where the negative elongation factor is bound, or you can be in the activated state where the path complex is bound, right? They exclude each other. But now you may say, that's nice. I understand why there can only be this complex or the other complex. But how is it converted? How is the post complex converted into the active elongation complex? And that involves phosphorylation by this PTFB factor. And this PTFB complex contains the CDK9 kinase, which phosphorylates not only polymerase, but also NELF and other factors. And what happens when these phosphorylations occur? We've actually mapped about 50 phosphorylations, and for most of them, we don't know what they do. That's actually quite typical. When you look you know, at the phosphoproteome, you get hundreds, thousands, tens of thousands of phosphocytes in the proteome. But for most of those sites, you don't know what their function is and why phosphorylation occurs there. But then sometimes you find very critical phosphocytes. And here we found some 
in this so-called linker region to the C-terminal repeat domain. Remember, this is this long tail-like region of the polymerase that you also need to phosphorylate for promoter escape. It can be phosphorylated by CDK7, which is part of TF2H, and that happens during initiation. But it can also be phosphorylated by CDK9 uh, during this pause state, during elongation. <coughs> but there's also a linker that connects the body of polymerase to the C-terminal domain. And this linker can also get phosphorylated. This was found by the lab of Chris Hill. And what is interesting is that this domain of SPT6, that is called tandem SH2 domain, actually binds to this phosphorylated linker. And so basically you have a mechanism here that can couple the phosphorylation of polymerase to the recruitment of SPT6. So you have the pause state, right? The linker is unphosphorylated. Now CDK9 is coming, it's phosphorylating the linker. And then this linker can stably bind this domain in SPT6. And so SPT6 is bound to polymerase. And you know, this is part of the mechanism how you convert the paused complex into an actively transcribing complex. It's not the only mechanism, there's other phosphorylations, many of them we don't understand. Uh, but overall, you know, phosphorylation destabilizes the pause state and it stabilizes the actively elongating state. Now we get to this multiomics approach. Because now we want to look, you know, we looked at mechanisms now from a uh, bottom-up perspective, right? We uh, reconstituted the complexes, the post complex, the activated complex. We solved the structures. We did biochemistry. We saw the pausing in vitro. We can map phosphorylation sites. All of this we can do in the test tube. But now we want to know where in cells does this mechanism occur? You know, is it happening on all genes? And can we learn something when we now take the top-down approach, the functional genomics approach, right? And um, actually the answer is yes. You see things that you would predict from your hypothesis, but you also see new things. And the new things are very exciting because you learn something. So that's also my advice when you <coughs> go to the lab later, you do your master thesis or your PhD. Instead of thinking, ah, this and that was published, so I should see that too, also think about observing new things that are not in the literature and not to you know, disregard them, but rather to uh, dig deeper. And you know, if you find something new, something unexpected, uh, assume that there's something you can be, that can be learned. So this is the nature of serendipity, where this chance actually um, only hits those people who are prepared in their mind to actually observe, you know, something about what can be learned, right? So this is serendipity. So, and we've ha had such a moment of serendipity when we did the multi-omics experiment. So now I need to quickly explain to you before I show you the results because it's a bit complicated. So basically, when you do functional genomics, you often, you know, to improve the signal, you often average over multiple uh, genes or, um, you know, what you can do is also you can um, align at certain sites in the genome to improve your signal. And we normally use the transcription start site, which is plus one, right? And here would be the transcribed region. This would be the promoter region. And then you can you know, collect your data and you line at the transcription start site. And then you can use this uh, protocol, which is called um, MNetSeq. And you will get a peak like this on many genes, you will get a peak like this. And then, you know, here maybe at the poly A side, you get another peak because remember termination occurs only later. And this MNET seek signal
the signal of, of the, the Mnet seek uh, signal actually reflects the position of paused RNA polymerase two. Because that relates to your question, what we do is we map the three prime ends of those RNAs that are basically stuck in a polymerase. So, you know, you, you purify that polymerase and then you sequence those RNAs and then you get the three prime end of those RNAs. And so you get a peak of occupancy with paused polymerases, right? Because the longer a polymerase stays at a certain point, the higher the likelihood that you actually capture it. So now we get this peak of post polymerases. But where does that signal come from? You know, when, when you get different types of signals, different strengths of the signal, where does it come from? It could either be that there's more polymerases here because there's a higher initiation frequency, or it could be that those polymerases stay longer, right? So, and that is what we call the pause duration D. It basically means a polymerase stays here for, you know, a certain time. That's the pause duration. But there's also the initiation frequency I, which is the number of times that initiation occurs. Now, since it's so difficult to measure that directly, what we do is we have our TTC signal, which basically, you know, looks like this. And then here it's kind of going down. So we have a TTC signal. And remember, these are the fragments of newly synthesized RNA. So in an ideal world, it would look like this. It can look a little bit different, but that signal actually reflects the initiation frequency. And why is that? When it goes up, it basically means that there was a higher rate of initiation. There were more polymerases making these newly synthesized RNA fragments. When it goes down, there's a lower rate of initiation, right? So from this signal, we can actually estimate the initiation frequency. But it's not the real initiation frequency. It's actually the productive initiation frequency because some of those polymerases can also terminate. Uh, and that is called premature termination. Premature termination because they fall off, right? It's only a fraction. But many of them, of course, are also being activated and then elongate. And so if you measure, you know, if you take a window here and you measure the TTC signal, it will give you an estimate of the initiation frequency, but it's the productive initiation frequency. It does not include polymerases that fall off, right? But you can get this estimate of the initiation frequency, and then you can calculate the pause duration. And why is that? It's because this peak here now, when you know the initiation frequency and this peak changes, you know it's because of changes in the pause duration. So you can disentangle the two factors that contribute to the formation of that peak, which are the initiation frequency, so how many polymerases are actually in this window here, and you disentangle that from the pause duration, which is the time the polymerase stays in this region. And this is why we do multi-omics, you see? You cannot do that with a single method alone. And so basically now, we will look in this movie at these two parameters, one that comes from TTSeq directly, and the other one that comes from the NetSeq signal, uh, from which, you know, which is then um, uh, taken, a, there's a ratio taken with the initiation frequency so that you can um, extract the pause duration, right? So in, in the movie that I show you, we will see how the pause duration and the initiation frequency change when we inhibit this kinase CDK9. Remember that this transition here to the active complex, so to go from the paused elongation complex to EC star, this transition here is triggered by this positive transcription elongation factor B. 
and this contains a kinase called CDK9, right? So the prediction now from our hypothesis from the biochemistry and also a lot of literature that people have done would be that when we inhibit that kinase, right, then we stabilize the pause complex and we don't get this activated complex anymore or much less of it. So the prediction would be that the pause duration is going up. Now the polymerase stays longer here because it's not being converted to the active complex, right? So that is our hypothesis. And now we do the experiment, huge experiment. <laughs> so, and that also a PhD student in the lab did it, Saskia. Gressel and uh, Björn Schwab, a bioinformatician, actually invented this um, kind of kinetic analysis. Can I just finish and then we discuss it in detail? Uh, now I, I want to just show you the movie. So you see pause duration, initiation frequency, and then you see the change when you inhibit CDK9, right? And so each dot in that movie is one human gene. Remember, we do everything at once. So here you see it. So what you see here is this productive initiation frequency. And here you see the pause duration, right? And each of those dots uh, represent the activity of one human gene. And our hypothesis was that when we inhibit CDK9, the pause duration should go up, right? The polymer should pause longer. And it's actually what you see. You see it goes up, but what is even more dramatic and unexpected is that the initiation frequency is dramatically going down. And this is what I wanted to say, you know, you, and, um, you, know, you have your bottom-up experiment, you generate a hypothesis. Then you test that hypothesis using the top-down multi-omics approach. And then your hypothesis is, I would say, supported by the change in posturation, but you also see something new. And so actually that circle that I showed you in the beginning, you know, that you go forth and back between experiments and forming hypotheses and testing it, it's actually not a circle, it's actually a spiral, right? This is how science works. Very important to remember. And if you don't use, if you now would ignore that and you say, oh, maybe I, you know, I have to repeat the experiment, it should only, only the post duration should change, right? Then you will stay in your circle but if you measure it three times and you talk to your colleagues and you check everything and you have your controls and you're sure about it, then you learn something new and you actually go up in, in circles, right? You don't go around in circles, but you go up in a, in a spiral. You learn something new. You get a better overview of how the system works, right? Now you had a question. That explains it. Now, I didn't tell you the full truth, and that is some of those polymerases can do the premature termination. And when we did this, this was still disputed, you know, some people believed it, some didn't. But now there's actually evidence from several laboratories that really a fraction of polymerases that are paused also terminate. And it's yet another level of regulation. And this is something, that's why I mentioned the STL seek to you. Is something where people are trying now to get better protocols to measure this. Because, you know, we would have to go from using two omics experiments to three experiments to actually <coughs> distinguish between productive initiation frequency and real initiation frequency. And the difference between them will be the <laughs> premature termination. So now we reached, you know, the active research. Uh, you can see that there's still things we don't understand. So basically what we learned so far, you initiate transcription, promote escape, polymerase pauses. It can be converted by this positive transcription elongation factor B into an actively transcribing complex. But what is new, this pause complex has a negative effect on initiation. Um, it can also be inhibitory to initiation. And this is how you can regulate genes on the elongation level because elongation influences also initiation. And now we come to this termination issue, because there was another PhD student, he's still here, Isaac Fianu, 
a very great student who solved the structure of a large complex integrator bound to a pause polymerase complex. And why did we do that? Because it's actually the integrator complex that is responsible for this early termination. So this is all very new, you know, we published it a year ago. And so what's happening is that this larger integrator complex can recognize the paused state of the polymerase. It can cleave the nascent RNA. That makes the whole elongation complex very vulnerable because when you cleave the nascent RNA at the five prime, you remove the cap structure. But the five prime cap is absolutely important to protect the RNA from exonuclease degradation, right? And so it makes the polymerase very vulnerable. And it uses other mechanisms that we don't fully understand to terminate the polymerase. <clears throat> but it's, it's really a fascinating complex that also binds to this negative elongation factor um, and can therefore sense the pause state. So it can basically sense whether polymerase is bound to the negative elongation factor. You can either bind integrator or you bind PATH and SPT6. You cannot bind both. So it's again the same principle. You know, you can either be in the pause state, in the activated state, or in a state of pre-termination. And the factors are mutually exclusive, you know. Now you see how this RNA cleavage works. There's the nascent RNA extending from the polymerase active site. And there's one subunit, an integrator, which is an endonuclease. And this can open up and then accommodate the nascent RNA transcript. And here's the active site, which can cleave the nascent RNA. And it actually cleaves the nascent RNA about 20 nucleotides from the three prime end. So then you get a cut here. But of course, here's the five prime end with the cap. And that means you remove the cap and you destabilize the whole complex. <coughs> so integrator recognizes the PEC by binding in particular also NEL. It excludes PATH and SPD6. So you cannot move from the POS state to the activated state. It basically blocks uh, this activation. And it even has a phosphatase that dephosphorylates POL2, so it counteracts, you know, the activation mechanism. You know, as always in the cell, there's competing um, activities. So the kinase tries to activate the polymerase, but this complex tries to de deactivate, inactivate the polymerase. And then it docks to the RNA exit site, it opens its endonuclease and cleave the RNA. And then somehow it will um, we don't fully understand that it will open the clamps around the nucleic acids so that the nucleic acids can be released and the polymerase is terminated. Okay, now we move one step further and that's the last thing for today. We move to the nucleosome. You know, we talked about the pre-initiation complex, the post-elongation complex, which is about 50 base pairs downstream of the transcription start site. And we know from functional genomics, from MNAs mapping, that the so-called plus one nucleosome is located at about 140 base pairs from the start site. This is now uh, again in um, metazoan cells. So now since we have all those structures, we can build a model. So this is not a structure that we determined as a whole, but it's a model based on structures of the individual components, right? And what is interesting is that actually everything fits, it just fits um, the situation that you observe in vivo. So in principle, such a complex can form. But now what is really important to remember is the kinetics. And this is why I show you this. You know, if you just see that structure, you could get the impression, yeah, that all these things bind and then what happens? How do you regulate? How do you move? What you have to always think is of kinetics. You have to think about kinetics. And so we know that pausing is in the range of minutes. We know that from this kind of experiment that we've done, but others have measured it in different ways. And everybody agrees it's more in the range of minutes. But we know from light microscopy, from live cell imaging, 
that the pre-initiation complex is stable only for seconds. Totally different scenario. So basically the way you have to look at it is that in principle if there was no pausing you could initiate every few seconds, right? You can have a very high initiation frequency. Can you imagine then, you know, how, how many mRNA molecules you make? But there is a limit to this initiation frequency that is set by the pause polymerase, which sits there for one, two, three, four, five minutes, even longer. And during that time, you can assemble your pre-initiation complex, but, you know, the polymerase cannot escape from the promoter because there's a pause polymerase sitting just next to it. Right? And so this is how you regulate transcription on the elongation level. You influence the initiation events. So always keep the kinetics in mind when you think about regulation. And now the pause polymerase happens to sit just in front of the plus one nucleosome. And uh, this is something we want to discuss next. Uh, this is the summary how far we are now, and now for the rest of the time I just talk about the nucleosome. So initiation converts the polymerase to a pause state, but the pause state has this inhibitory effect on new initiation. When you recruit the positive transcription elongation factor B, you activate the elongation complex. Now it goes through this nucleosome, but also through following nucleosomes. But when you recruit the integrator complex, then you convert the pause state into a pre-termination state, and that can lead to termination, right? But now we want to know, once you've converted the pause state into the actively elongating state, how does that polymerase, the active polymerase, how does that go through the nucleosome, right? This is the big question. So here is our activated state with the DSIF, with SPD6, with PAF, and there's a nucleosome in front of it, right? So now, again, we did both, you know, in vivo work and in vitro work to get closer to this problem. i just show you a few examples. So one thing is uh, you can check, you know, which of those elongation factors are actually needed for the polymerase to go through chromatin in cells. And you can do that by very rapidly degrading certain factors. You don't need to worry about that now, but there's a protocol that allows you to tag proteins and then to rapidly degrade them in cells. So after half an hour, one hour, they're gone. And then you can do this kind of multi-omics before and after the factor is depleted. And you can ask, you know, is the polymerase still going through chromatin or does it get stuck? And here's one example. Remember SPT6, a very important elongation factor? If you deplete it from cells, then the polymerase gets stuck already in the first nucleosome. This is the position of the first nucleosome. You can map that by mna seq And then when you look at the net seq signal, so this is actually the signal here. Um, when you look at that signal of pause polymerases in this region of the nucleosome, you see in the control, it pauses in front of the nucleosome and then the polymerase goes through. That's how you interpret this occupancy profile. But then when SPD6 is not there, it has a much harder time. A lot of the complexes get stuck somewhere in the nucleosome, right? So that is in vivo, in, in cells. And you can do that for all the factors. And then you learn which factors are important in cells for a polymerase to go through a nucleosome. But again, you want to know the mechanism, right? So you go back to the in vitro work. You do structural biology, you do biochemistry. And we solved some structures. Uh, you know, we found factors that are important. Some of them we also knew from the literature that they are important, so we could immediately work on them. Uh, CHD1, for example, is an ATPase. It's a remodeler. It can pump DNA into the active site of polymerase. And this way, it can help the polymerase to overcome this obstacle, the nucleosome that it needs to traverse. And there's other factors like the FACT, which is a, an assembly factor. It's a chaperone uh, that can preserve histones at the site of transcription. And this can bind to a partially unraveled nucleosome. So basically, the way you, you um, do structural biology here is that you actually visualize the biochemical events 
So you put a polymerase in front of a nucleosome. Again, a long PhD thesis of somebody called Lucas Farnung, who's now um, a professor in the US at Harvard. And then uh, Moritz has taken that system and developed it further. And so basically what you can do is that you put the polymerase in front of the nucleosome, and then you add nucleoside triphosphates, the polymerase will move into the nucleosome trying to unravel the DNA from the nucleosome. And you can also stop the polymerase in this process, and then you take this whole complex and you solve the structure. So you can get such intermediates of nucleosome transcription. You can get structures of biochemical intermediates. Right? And when you have enough of those structures, you can animate the process, and you can actually get movies. And this was a lot of work that Moritz did, uh, but I think it's very helpful to understand what, how it may look like. You know, there's some science fiction because we have a limited number of structures, but we have enough snapshots. So you see the polymerase is moving forward, the DNA is moving into the active site, and this way it unravels, it unravels the DNA from the nucleosome, and at some stage H2A, H2B gets lost because the DNA contacts are lost. Right? And the polymerase can go a little bit further, but what we also observed is that then at some stage there can be backtracking because you know, the, the system is now um, unstable because there's a lot of DNA protein contacts that have been lost. So when you run backwards, the RNA goes backwards through the pore, but you also, you see the RNA coming out here, but you also reestablish uh, contacts in the nucleosome between DNA and histones. So actually the system tries to optimize itself. It tries to minimize the energy. And you just saw TF2S, how it can rescue the polymerase from the arrested state. So polymerase can try again, right? Now it has um, cleaved the RNA and you can try again uh, to go through the nucleosome. So basically it's a um, competition between the nucleosome and the polymerase. The polymerase is a very strong motor. It can generate about 20 piconewtons. We know that from biophysics. So it can unravel DNA but it may get stuck, and then it needs the help of its friends of these elongation factors uh, to go through nucleosomes. And some of them also help the polymerase to retain histones at the site of transcription. And that is currently an active field of research. You know, how do you make sure that the histones are not lost, but that they are uh, shuffled to the wake of the polymerase so that you reestablish chromatin in the wake of polymerase. And that probably requires also a lot of chromatin remodeling and a lot of ATP hydrolysis. Okay, I think we're ready for take home message and then the time is actually also over. So this is really what you should remember because this was confusing to people for many years. If you want to switch a gene on you need to make more mRNA molecules per time. And you do that by, by using a higher initiation rate or establishing a higher rate of initiation. And how can you get a higher rate of initiation? You can recruit more factors, form the pre-initiation complex more frequently, but also you need to make sure that the post polymerase is not staying there for too long. You have to decrease the post duration because this way you allow for more initiation events per time. And then third aspect, you have to also make sure that not so many polymerases are lost on the way. So this kind of premature termination should be minimized so that most of the polymerases make it to the end and you get a high number of complete mRNA messages. This is how you switch a gene on, right? So, summary, you know, John Liss, a great colleague at Cornell University, uh, 13 years ago, he wrote this review in Nature, uh, defining the important steps of early transcription where most of the regulation occurs. We heard about the DNA opening yesterday by pioneer factors and remodelers. We heard about pick formation. Then we heard about DNA opening escape of the polymerase and pausing of polymerase. And then today also the conversion of the post-polymerase to the 
um, actively transcribing polymerase, the you know, exchange of factors, the phosphorylation, and then finally about the passage of polymerase through nucleosomes. So actually we have filled in many of these gaps of our understanding on the mechanistic level. And here's again the take home message. If you want to regulate, you regulate initiation mainly. Activators can help you to have a higher rate of initiation to recruit co-activators and so forth. But also pausing has this feedback on initiation and something I won't have time to talk about, I just touch briefly on it. Later in elongation, for example, during co-transcription of spliceosome assembly, you also have such checkpoints and there's still feedback going back to the pause complex, then going back to initiation. So actually the promoter knows it's almost magic. If something goes wrong later on with co-transcription or splicing or so, the promoter knows and down-regulates initiation. It's really fantastic. I won't have time to talk about all of that, but just two more slides. Um, we solved the first structure of a part of the spliceosome to the transcribing polymerase. So this is the beginning of understanding also how splicing can be coupled to transcription, right? And the postdoc who did that, Su Young, is now in Cambridge and is actually following <coughs> this up. So she can base her career on that finding, you know, looking at cold transcription of spliceosome assembly. And before she left, we came up with this model where polymerase is elongating over an intron, it binds U1 SNRF, and then it retains the 5' splice site. And what is so interesting about this model is that, remember we dis were discussing these huge introns and the, the exons being very far away? How can it be that the two ends of the RNA transcript find each other for splicing? when the intron is about 10,000 nucleotides long, such a long RNA. How can it be? And this for the first time explains that in an easy way. Because when the polymerase continues, there's formation of a loop. This is our model. That's why we call it the growing intron loop model. So there's a loop. So in, instead of the polymerase you know, moving away and then the end of the intron is here and here, the polymerase takes the end of the intron with it. And so there's a loop formed. And so when the polymerase reaches the uh, three prime end of the intron, basically the three prime splice site here, the two splice sites will be juxtaposed. They will be close to each other because you have a long loop, right? And so it really, that's the take home message. It really is useful to look at mechanism because such mysteries of biology, you can only resolve when you look at mechanism. Now it's like, you know, nobody has yet proven this, there's evidence for this, it's still a model, it's a hypothesis. But at least now we can understand how it may work, something that we couldn't understand before. Right. Okay, that's what I wanted to tell you today and um, end with a few questions for the future. You know, there's, you may now think after the slides I showed you, oh, they, they solved transcription and now it's fine, let's move on. But there's still so many open questions, as always. You know, the way science works is you try to open a door and you do your PhD and after a few years you get the code or you get the right key and you open the door and then you have a better look at things. But what you see is actually 10 closed doors. <laughs> that, that is how science works. And then you, you know, the next generation is trying to open more doors. But each time you get into a new room and you learn something, you see a few new things, but then you can ask new questions, right? Because there's still mysteries. And so this idea that, you know, we come to an end and now move on, forget about it. I think science is an endless frontier. You know, when Newton came and he had the wonderful formula how things move on the sky and so people thought it's done. But then Einstein came, right? And that's already 100 years or more ago. So there's, science is an endless frontier, so you should have enough questions to look at. Just a few of the questions. You know, in five years we have different questions, but can we actually get structures, not only of these complexes, but entire genes, maybe 10, 20 nucleosomes with polymerase in between? It looks as if we may be able to do that. We just had a seminar yesterday which 
I think is going the right direction. Can we actually, you know, instead of reconstituting these complexes in vitro, can we get them from cells and then solve the structure? Uh, can we reconstitute this whole transition that we were looking at um, in the test tube and then stop, you know, every few base pairs and take all the structures to basically make a movie of the whole uh, transition? I think it becomes possible. There's also a PhD student in the lab. She is doing it. She's in the first year and she has already some results showing that this may become possible, that you do the reaction in the test tube, you stop, 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 and then you do all the structures. Can we actually measure this premature termination? We were discussing it. I think it requires development on the genomic side. And we have evidence that we will be able to actually transcribe an entire genome in the test tubes. Now, this is crazy. Why should you do that? It's quite simple. There was also a physicist, Feynman, you probably know him. And he said, I can only understand what I can build. And it's pretty, it's true, huh? If you open, you know, your car and you take out parts and so forth, you understand a little bit how it may work, right? But if somebody would give you all the parts and say, build a car, it's a different challenge. <laughs> but if you're able to do this, then you really know how a car works, right? If you know where every screw goes and how things move. So it's the same here. So we observe how the genome is transcribed in the cell. We understand more and more the kinetics. But we will only really understand it when we reconstitute this in the test tube. And what do you need for that? You need to have your genome on plasmids and you need to have hundreds of proteins purified, put them in the test tube and see which RNAs do I generate. Sequence all the RNAs and then compare those RNAs to the RNAs that the cell produces. And once this becomes similar, you know, maybe in your generation, then you know you understand transcription because everything you put in you know by name right you know exactly which proteins you put in well thanks for the attention thank you very much